So um, tell me a little bit about Tamir Goodman, the person. Uh, I think uh, Tamir Good, the person, um, motivated um, and driven by God and what God, you know, want, would want me to do in every situation. I think like that's what, uh, you know, I try strive for a day and night. Uh, that's always been my energy. And I guess in an increasing manner from year to year, I try to understand that more and more. And um, I think that's ultimately our goal in this world to reach the potential and what God sees in us. And uh, as you get older and more things come your way, both positive and negative successes, failures, mess ups, um, slam dunks, everything in between you, I think each person in their own way learns more and more. And I think that's if, at least for me, in my opinion, though, best way to live the most happy and meaningful life and also the greatest blessing. And I just, I love the blueprint of it. You always have meaning. You always have purpose. You always have motivation. You always kind of know how to try to at least try to handle every situation. So I think very, when, when we try to live a, a, a life that's connected with godliness, I think that's like our most organic and best way for a human to live. Nice. I I I once heard um, this um, this flow of definitions that really it really it, it really changed the way I looked at people. It and it said that the definition of the mineral life is to just be what it is. Inanimate objects they just are what they are. Tables, chairs, the def plants, the nature of who they are, the definition of who they are is they grow. Animals, they'll fight for their life. And humans want to be more than what they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, that's so cool. What is, when was the first time you, um, I guess, touched a basketball and realized there's more for there's more, this thing means more to you than it does to the typical person. But when did you when know that there was something? Yeah. Nine, nine, eight or nine. I remember playing with my other older brothers in the backyard and they beat me. Um, they were better than me. And I, we came in the kitchen and I was crying that I had lost. And my brothers told my mother to, they asked my mother to tell me to calm down. They tell Tamir it's just a game. You know, why does he care so much about the game? And I looked at my mother and I told her that it's not just a game for me. It means much more. I love it more than just a game. It's not just a game for me. And that that I, that was a big moment uh, that I remember. And another moment that kind of was a game changer for me was like probably when I was 10, I hit a game winning shot. Um, uh, playing at a local rec league and back in the 90s like there was this thing called like raising the roof when you thought you were the man you would, like raise the roof so I like mm -hmm. hit the game winning shot and I raised the roof and my father blessed memory uh, told me he was proud of me for having the game winning shot but he said we person should never react that way you should never react that you think you know your talents are from yourself you have to remember that they came from God and you always must practice humility and usually my father never said anything. He never, ever, he actually never did. He never commented anything in my whole life about basketball. That was the only time he's ever said anything to me about basketball. And that was, I guess, very serious to him if he said it. So those two moments, A, knowing that my mother supported me and she looked at me and even though my brothers told her to tell me to calm down, she didn't tell me to calm down. She just supported me with her eyes that I guess she realized it did mean more to me than a regular kid. Mm -hmm. And she backed me. And I think my father telling me that, I think he told that to me because he believed in me and he saw that like I was trying to go somewhere with basketball and he wanted me to keep that in mind. So I think those two moments, age nine and 10, were big game changers for me. Interesting. As I read your book, it seemed that as time went on, what basketball meant started to stretch. The boundaries yeah. of that meant and what you saw the potential that the, that the game had started to really grow at different stages, especially as the challenges mounted. You talk a little bit about, you know, what you feel like were the major stages in terms of what it meant to you initially and 
what were the changes that took place and what it means to you now? Yeah, I think when you're healthy, you know, when I was healthy, all a player ever thinks about is like succeeding on the court. That's all you do is you just want to play well. And I got hurt. And I mean, the first time I got hurt, my mother told me, you know, maybe you're done. And I, I thought she was like, how could you even possibly tell? Like nothing's ever going to keep me from playing basketball. Like, I don't care what injury it is, like whatever surgery, whatever it is. Like, I, but she was kind of right. But it took me seven years to realize she was right. I went to every single surgeon, every therapy, every rehab. And every time I came back, I just, I got hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt. And my knee never healed. And I think like that was the big moment where, okay, like basketball needs to transform. It's no longer about playing well. It's not an option for me to play well. I can't play anymore. So you know, what is this injury in the height of my prime teaching me? What is, you know, what, what am I supposed to do now? And I think when you're a basketball player, it's your double challenge because number one, all we ever knew was playing basketball. It's all I ever did is play basketball. I didn't like finish school. I didn't all my energy went to playing. And then when that ends, you're not really so prepared for, for other things. You see it with a lot of players, like as soon as they're done playing, like they're like hurt, they're, you're broken. You're, you you don't, all, you know, is taken away from you. So I had to kind of redefine what is basketball for me? What is my goal? What does God expect me to do with this game? And I feel like specifically that ended up allowing me to understand what basketball could do. I, I, the creativity that I have on a daily basis, the sensitivity that I have on a daily basis, the, the world that I'm in of just helping people and, you know, passionate about, I, I can't even explain like what that's tr transformed into. I mean, I haven't played professionally. I can't hear you. I think you're muted. Tamir, you're muted. It's very, very faint, super faint. I can barely hear you. Can you hear me? Teeny bit. I don't know what happened. Let me sign back on the link. Should I sign back on the link? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, now I can hear you. Now oh, I can now hear, you. hear me. Okay, great. So I'm saying, like, it's 2000. I haven't played professionally since 2009. And today is 2023. And literally, most of my day to day, the majority of my day was just helping people I connecting people through basketball, people in Italy, people in, like people just reaching out all over. And I feel like it's like sometimes in life we have like a vision of like what we want to accomplish. I want to be the best player I could be, but then like maybe God has like a totally vision, different career path for you, which is like, maybe it's not about you just only playing well on the court. Maybe it's helping people through basketball or creating things that will help people through basketball or thinking of different ways to connect to basketball on a deeper level, maybe that's, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. And I, and I never even realized that until I got hurt. So I think like, you know, Judaism teaches us every physical thing in the world. There's like a spiritual energy, like what is the spiritual energy behind basketball? And I think like, that's kind of like where my career has taken me. Like, how can we, you can unite people through basketball. How can we create products that'll help people through basketball? How can we uplift kids that are broken through basketball? How can we help professional players get even better? How can we, bring technology into the game to help players, coaches, fans, you know, this is kind of like my world now and I would not never have known about it or, and the educational projects I'm involved in, like had it not been for my injury. So I think like the, almost the greater the pain, the greater, <laughs> it's like my favorite thing in the world I can't do. Like I can't play basketball because many, I still, I cannot play basketball. It hurts so badly. So it's like sometimes specifically through that pain, you find your, the greater the pain, the more you find your calling, I guess, sometimes. Yeah. I, I probably, you probably would agree that basketball can mean something different to different people, um, you know, but I, I think my hunch is that you have a perspective on what do you think is unique about basketball in relation to other things or even other sports that it has that capacity to help people transform, develop, and unite? When you look at the game and the way the game is structured and the different parts of the game, what do you see as um, the unique positive qualities that basketball has? Well, I think passing makes it really unique. Uh, other team sports like baseball, 
it's very hard for one person to have so much um, say during a game or influence on a game, football, American football, soccer. It's just, it's hard. But basketball is the only team sport where, you know, one person could have so much influence on the game so quickly. Like if one person wants to be selfish on the court in basketball, they have that opportunity much more than other sports. And they could kind of like destroy the game basically. On the other hand, like you decide as a point guard, for example, my position, I'm going to be unselfish. I'm going to get all five players involved. And you could see it so quickly how it like has such an incredible impact on the game. So I think the ability to create so much change through unselfishness is what makes basketball so unique. And we're seeing it now in the NBA finals with Joker, who is just completely unselfish. He's just an unselfish player. Like they asked him the other night, like, um, you know, do you come in the game saying you're going to score X amount of points? Like, meaning I come in there aggressive. I'm going to score as many points as possible. Or like, what's your mindset? He's like, no, I just come in here and try to make the right play. And, and he's now like showing the world that through unselfishness, being an unselfish player and getting all five players involved, it's really uh, the most impactful and incredible way to be successful. And I think like that's what makes basketball unique because you could be very, you could have great influence by being unselfish. I think that's what, I think what that's what makes it unique. You know, that's, I've never heard that perspective. And in your book, you talk about passing, but I didn't make that link. And that really is unique. It almost, it almost feels like every single player on the basketball court has the choice and almost the opportunity that like similar, like a quarterback does in American football, where their awareness, their court awareness and their ability to like know who their teammates are and know what positions to put them in for them, as opposed to just thinking, what can I can do is put to the test so quickly. And that ball changes hands. Like, you know, in American football, there is only one quarterback and the way when he succeeds at what he's doing, it, it doesn't, it's not unselfish, you know, like he makes a great play. It's like, he made the pass right. more than he ever made the catch. But in basketball, it's like all the credit goes to the guy who scores the points mostly. And so everyone has that. It's kind of, challenge in that way on the court it's very interesting i never thought i never saw it that way I never yeah, you, saw hear it that great, way. you hear great great teams teams that win like they a lot of times they ask the team like wow you won the championship what was it they say coach got everyone to buy in we all bought in we're all being unselfish no one here is being selfish we're all bought into like a greater cause a greater good so it leads to success and i think basketball is like the greatest example of that because football you know, you, you have offensive players and then you have defensive players, right? Soccer, almost like the same thing. Baseball, similar to basketball. You're like all over the place and you're, you're either all in or you're not. And the second you start being selfish, it's going to impact the game immediately. Like right away. Everyone's going to see it. Wow. Fascinating. Um, as a basketball player, what was your biggest what do you feel like was your biggest strength? And what do you feel like was the thing that throughout your career you were always looking to improve the most? Like the part that you felt like was the weakest link in your game? Yeah, well, three things. For sure, passing was my greatest blessing. Being dyslexic, um, very hard for me to read and write till today, extremely hard. But God gave me like a special vision on the court. So it's hard for me to read, but he also blessed me with like a good vision. So like, making the right pass was for sure my my strongest uh, i could see things in in a special way i remember times like there are certain passes that you just don't throw on basketball like you would get in trouble for throwing a certain pass like the coaches teach don't throw that pass but for me they would let me throw that pass like i could just see different angles see different things i would see things on the court even that my teammates who were open didn't even notice they were open just from being very dyslexic um but on the other hand the dyslexic dyslexia if i ever played for a coach that had set plays instead of like an open offense or what we call motion offense or an offense where you're just reading what the game gives you read and react offense that was very hard for me because like the it's very hard with dyslexia like when they tell you have to be in certain places like you're going to cut down wait set a screen come back up 
He's just memorizing all that with the different angles and the right and the left. And all that was like a big mix in my brain. That was really hard. And then the greatest challenge though was the injuries just couldn't seem to stay healthy. Just kept going to hurt and hurt and hurt. And I uh, wish I was maybe a little stronger or bigger boned, but on the other hand, my injuries are what ultimately helped me reach my potential as a person. Like if I wouldn't have gotten hurt, I would have had better statistics, but I, I don't know if I would have reached my potential as a person. You know, that my, only my injuries helped me learn what that is. So mm -hmm. I don't know if I, would, I don't know if I would trade it. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about, do you understand how the dyslexia helps you see things that people ordinarily don't, don't see? Like, how does that work? Do you understand how that actually works? Yeah, see, basically when you're dyslexic, uh, especially when you're extremely dyslexic like me, you're because you're uh, compensating all day in our brain, we're constantly compensating. And while we're compensating, we're exercising parts of our brain that other people don't exercise. And that part of our brain, we end up being like really creative. We start, we could problem solve much, you know, we, we could problem solve, we could invent, we could see different angles, see different opportunities. Just your vision is like heightened because you're constantly exercising that part of your brain where a, a typical person doesn't need to do that throughout the day. Um, so mm -hmm. when you get on the court, it's just like, you could, I could see like little advantages that <laughs> the offensive player has over the defense that maybe someone else wouldn't see. And I could actually get the ball there right in that angle, right at that time, or almost see someone open um, before they're even open. I, I remember as a kid, like we were all watching the game, um, my brothers and my father, blessed memory. And we were all, the whole family was watching the game. I was maybe like 11 watching an NBA game. And I yelled out in front of everyone, Ali, you like Ali, you. And then like four seconds later, there was an alley -oop. And like, everyone's wow. like, oh my God, like tell me your head is she's, I was like 11 years old. It's just like my brain, it's just like part of being dyslexic. Like you just see things differently. It's just the way it is. You just my whole day, I'm seeing things differently <laughs> and people and myself and products and situations and kids and players. And you just like, I have a heightened sensitivity. Wow. How else does that play out in life specifically? Like what else do you see that typically people don't? Just a lot of problem solving. I think like a lot of times, like in business, people are stuck. People can't think of a solution. And then I, in like two seconds, something will come in my head and I'm like, oh my God, how did you just think of that? And you don't have an answer just other than like dyslexia. Like we had a conference call. I like worked with Fabric, this really uh, incredible fan engagement company on Thursday. There was like a company call and there was like a big challenge and one direction and another direction, like a rift about something. And like within seconds, I, I had the solution and everyone was like, oh my God, that's perfect. Like, it's just, it's just something about being dyslexic or like, I just, I think like you could problem solve, you could think of solutions, you have a heightened sensitivity to s failure, struggle, people, um, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, I don't know. It's just, you could, I, I could almost like when I coach a kid, I could almost like tell what's wrong with them in their life even before I had a chance to even really know their story and then like think what drills will help them and be feel empowered and bring it out to the rest of their life. Like, and I never plan on it. I never plan on it. I never like write out like, Hey, here's what drills I'm going to do. I, it's just something I get on the court. I feel it. And, and we just go for it. Also speaking engagements. Like I'm going to, you know, this big speaking engagement tomorrow in New York. I have no idea what I'm going to say. Uh, I just go there and I just feel the energy of the room and I, I feel see the people's faces and then just open up my heart. I hope it, hope it comes out good. <laughs> right. I mean, it sounds that it's like the only way to do it is unscripted. Because otherwise, yeah. you can't books. read. You can't, I can't read. I can't read. Like I, you know, I went with Aviv Net, we had this grand opening um, for at Dick Sporting Goods for my product. And like they prepared this whole thing for me to read up there on the first day. And I, and I was like backstage trying to read it for like two hours. And then as soon as the, everyone was there, I, I had media, everyone, they gave me the script to read. And I thought I had it pretty good. I, and I wasn't even planning on it. I just saw the, I just flipped the paper down, put it upside down. I'm like, I, I can't. Anyone who knows me, I, I can't read this, actually. I, I put it down and I just talked <laughs> and, and ended up being pretty good. <laughs> That's. Oh man, I I I I I typically 
I kind of feel similar to that in ways where I like even even this conversation, like I started writing down like what I was going to ask or something like that. But it's like I can't even look at it. Like once I start talking to you, it's like I, it's like it's like it's like you just like get into the flow of what you're talking about. And it's just um, it, it's very it really interrupts that there's I can kind of relate to what you're saying. And maybe maybe may, I don't know if it's it's similar, but I feel like there's this very subtle voice in me that gives me kind of like ideas and insights into people that I, I can't be going off anything else. If I'm going to listen to that, I just got to be in sync with it a hundred percent. You know, it's like, yeah. I think like there's closed people and there's open people and I love open people. The more open we are, the more godliness could run through us and we could help other people and people could help us. And, what I say is that like a lot of people try to close everything in life. Like they're so protective. They got to get theirs right now, right here, you know, immediate results. Like I'm always like a yes guy, like, yes, whatever. Let's just go. Let's see what happens. Let's go like big picture. Let's, you know, someone wants to talk to me that has nothing to do with basketball or maybe a regular person would say, no, like you're wasting my time. Like, you know, I need to make X amount of dollars each day. And by me going to meet with you, I'm losing out right now. And I'm always like, no, man, who? Is? let's go. Let's talk. Let's meet. Let's just be open. And, you know, the, you never lose out by being open. I, I just don't feel that way. You always learn. You can meet because basically because like God is one. So like when you attach to that oneness, which is like great, great space, open, big, I just feel like you never lose out. You know, you, you're just always, everything ends up being connected somehow or another. Or like we say in Judaism, like you save one person, you save the whole world. Like, what does that mean? Like, I doesn't, oh, like I'm see someone drowning. I saved, like, you never know. Like just so many times in life, we go through things that like seem, seemingly like make no sense. And then like years later, you see that it's all connected. It's all one. It's all this big picture. And I love working with big picture people. Like it's, it's amazing things happening because you, you don't block the blessings. You're basically a giant receptacle. You're like a pool for all this oneness to come together. Nice. So what, what's very unique about your story is that you didn't just feel that basketball and your connection with God and who you were were like two separate things. You actually, it seems like they were, they were just, they were completely inseparable for you. Like, there was no there was no entertaining basketball without a yarmulke like it or, or, or basketball on Shabbos like that that wasn't a question and we like and I'm wondering where did that where do you think that that clarity came from I would say like you know three things uh, my safta my grandmother was a holocaust survivor she lived with us like six months out of the year so just being around her was like you just couldn't explain it like her just she was like a living angel in her house literally uh and that survived two camps and just wanting to always honor her and what she had been through and and knowing that she lived in israel and stuff the rest of the year just just being connected to her um number two my father was a um my father was a very uh special human being i would say that loved helping people and he always did it with his keep on um so i wanted to kind of be like him. And then number three, when I was younger, I used to go to the Lubavitch Rebbe in New York. And um, those were some, the Rebbe used to have these like, you know, these parades, different Lag Borma parades and stuff like that. And just the Jewish pride of those parades and holding up signs about Jewish pride and different things like that. And experiencing that, the excitement of that, uh, that was, that was, uh, I would say those three things like you know, I had the most amount of impact. I mean, I can't say like I'm a great person or a righteous person, but those three uh, things really helped me try to be a proud Jew and, and through basketball and not separate the two. Like those are all brought Judaism and basketball is one thing for me. It was the, the Log Bomer phrase? Yep. Yeah, I actually have a picture of me walking in front of the Rebbe with my Air Jordans on at the Log Bomer parade. And uh, even back then, it was like so one with me that like I'm going to the Rebbe's parade with my Jordans on. Like it was it was one thing for me. Like it was. Yeah. Wow. 
did you ever did you ever like talk like go by dollars and actually have like a conversation with Rebbe? I didn't have a conversation with him about it, but the last dollar I got was in 1991, and I was wearing a a Jordan jersey. I just I was wearing just a jersey, just like a, like a Michael Jordan jersey. So I guess he assumed that I liked basketball or I don't know what, but yeah. Uh, uh, he didn't say. Any, he just said the bracha v'atzlacha. But obviously, to me, it, it. I mean, my relationship that and that. I mean, I think about the rabbi every single day. I, like when I go to New York, like tomorrow, like before I go back, you know, on the plane, like I always make sure to try to go to the all. Like I, I'm always, in, I just, I, I feel very, very blessed to have uh, those moments with the rabbi. Last month, um, impact on me my entire life for sure. Yeah, for me, I didn't get to see, I grew up in New Jersey, but I never got to actually see the Rebbe while he was alive. But about four years ago, I had an incredibly vivid dream. Yeah. Standing there by dollars, and it really, really impacted me. I, I, I felt, I, I felt like I had like a visit. It was, it was so, um, it felt so real. The other part about it that was really interesting and odd was that the same dream played itself twice. Like in that night, it's like I dreamt something and then the exact same thing played a second time, which I never remember experiencing before. It's having exactly the same dream repeat. Um, and it really impacted the direction I took in life after that. Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt to me that this physical world, the way that we see it, it, that that isn't all. Like, there's a lot more stuff going on. There's a lot of spiritual worlds, and there's a lot of things. It would be a shame if things <laughs> were just as simple as we saw them. You know, that would be a shame because what could we really understand? Our our mind is so small, really, compared to the greatness of the world. So, um, I feel like no doubt that a person like the Rebel, whose whole life was dedicated um, to helping others. And now that is in a now that he's in a more spiritual world or somewhere else, all of a sudden is just going to stop and not want to be around to somehow positively impact the world. So I definitely believe that. And um, you know, even before my father passed away, like who, he was totally healthy. Um, I just had a feeling that morning that something really bad was going to happen, and there was no reason in the world for me to think that. And I actually told my wife, like, I'm going to put the car seats in better because I feel like we're gonna have to take a long drive today. And I literally, I physically went out, put in the car seats better. And then the phone rang at lunchtime. And my mother called, said, your father passed away at work today. Come in for the funeral. We were like a five hour drive away. And the first thing I told my wife was, I was like, didn't I tell you, like, we're going to go for a long drive today? She's like, yeah. Why? I'm like, well, my father just passed away. We have to go for the funeral. And she's like, what? I'm like, yeah. So it was like, I know that there's this world isn't it like there's there's energies there's you know it, it, it's a lot deeper than what we see <laughs> wow wow uh, a friend of mine here in israel was telling me about how his great his great aunt or had um a brother who was a pilot in world war ii and his plane got shot down and everybody said that he was dead and she always had this kind of clairvoyant connection with her brother. They just knew things about each other or where they were. And she's like, no, he's like hiding in a cellar somewhere, eating cheese or stuff like that. And like everyone thought, thought she was crazy. They were sure he was dead. And then he like, after the war, he popped up. Yeah, I, I believe in all that, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, why, why do you think your father didn't say much about basketball? Like your whole, like your life was like, oh, like, what do you, what, what, what was the reason for that? I think two things. I think he just wanted to focus on unconditional love and just be a father. I think a lot of times other parents, um, maybe put too much pressure on their kids about sports. And my father understood that sports, you, you have to do it from your own love. You can't do it to please your parents. It's just not going to work. It's too intense and there's too much training. And I think to him, he wanted to focus more on the unconditional love and just know, wanted me to know that he was always here for me, which he was like, if I had to say something, he would always listen, but he never spoke back. He never said like, you should have shot or should have sprinted back to defense or you should have passed on that possession. Um, 
he just never did. So I, I, I decided I wasn't going to do that with my son too. Like, um, you know, I, I was going to be the same way with my son and I stayed away from it all these years. And then my coach who raised me, who I still talk to probably once or twice a day, uh, told me, you know, at some point your son's going to need you to talk about basketball. And I was like, no, nah, I don't think so. Because yeah, I told him, you know, you know, I was with my father. I'm not. And then he's like, no, but he's going to need you. And, um, over the last, I guess, 12 to 14 months, I realized that my coach was right because for my son, that's his mode of communication. Everything is through basketball. And, you know, so I've been talking a little bit about basketball with my son and realizing that like with him, it actually brings us closer. So I guess it's, it's, it's almost like if it wasn't for talking about basketball, he, we pro he, we just wouldn't really like, that's his way of like communicating. <laughs> so mm -hmm. It, you know, if it wasn't for that, there really wouldn't be anything else. So I think everyone is different. I think for me, my, with my father, I think maybe because I had a coach, such a close coach, um, then my father felt like his job was just to have the unconditional love. Um, but maybe for my son, who doesn't really have that type of coach in his life yet, maybe I do need to be able to talk to him about basketball a little more. So just interesting. When I watched the video, there was something about on your website, that 10 minute video. There was something about Coach Katz that I felt was really, really special. That he had, he had wisdom. It felt like he had so much wisdom beyond the court um, and real deep understanding. Yeah, he, I tell everyone I would have never been able to accomplish this without Coach Katz. I mean, I, I always say like I, their fathers in my life, let's say it was my father, my father, my my father-in-law, I loved him so much. He was also a coach. They both passed away. The Rebbe passed away, you know. So, and I've always had Coach Katz, and I just thank God that I still he's my father. You know, my father. That I still have that's living, and he's just he's so smart. He's the smartest basketball mind I've ever met in my life. Um, but again, what you're what you're touching on is true. Is that like his intent, his w wisdom, why he does everything. What's intention? Why did he get into basketball? Why does he coach basketball? What are we supposed to be doing through basketball? All that what I learned through him, and I'm forever grateful for that. And I love him. I love him. What? How many? So the Torah says, like, find yourself a rabbi, a mentor. Like, how many people in their life could say they found that at age eight? I'm 41 now, and I still have the same person. Like, it's it's rare. such it's so rare, and also someone that believed in you from day one. I mean. He told my mother when I was nine years old that I was going to play college basketball. He told her. <laughs> rare, so rare. And, uh, and a lot of it is because what I've experienced, which is very, very painful, is outgrowing mentors. Like I've had stages in life where I was very close to a mentor, but then I realized at some point that I kind of, like they were holding me back. Like I kind of had right. that. Um, and wow that's so i don't i don't think i've met a single person who's yeah. had this. i don't think well, i have either but i let him know that <laughs> yeah wow he must have some special sauce <laughs> yeah, he's amazing yeah um what do you think was one of the things that he told you that was most impactful in your both your basketball career and your life well, I think, again, it was like the combination of the physical and the spiritual. It wasn't ever just physical. That really spoke to me at a young age. But I think what really helped me a lot at a young age is that he taught me how to be an adult when I was 14, 15. Like he taught me how to pick myself up, how to say sorry, how to be accountable. I think being accountable and not running away from challenges and never let a society dictate what you can or cannot do. Um, just a lot of principles and values that you learn through the game that he, he, he made me like do when I was very young, he, I learned how to pick myself up and that I never settle. I think those two things right there, uh, most kids want to run, would, would have run away from a lot of things that I experienced and they would have quit. And he taught me how to be resilient. I think. What were one of the things that was really hard? at that young age that, that he kind of supported you through? 
a couple of things. Like one time I had a really bad shooting night. I was like eight for 24. And after the game, the media wanted to talk to me and I, I didn't want to talk to them. I wanted to go out the back door of the locker room and go home. And he <laughs> said, boy, you could talk to them when you play well. You better be able to talk to them when you don't play well. Get back, get out there. Go talk to them right now. And I said, what well, I say? What should I say? I said, he said, tell them the truth. You suck tonight and you got to get better. <laughs> and he taught me how to like do that. He's like, you know, you just got to do it. And, you know, so like that other times when he used to take me to play against college guys that were um, better than me when I was only 16 and they'd steal the ball for me and they were physical with me and I just wanted to quit and just go home. And he'd be like, like, do you want to play in college? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, if you want to play in college, you're going to have to be able to play against the speed and the strength. So if you don't want to do it, let's just go on. But if you want to do it, you got to pick yourself up and go do it. You're, no one's going to do this for you. You got to do it. So, you know, just like different things like that, force myself to pick myself up. Mm -hmm. Wow. And there's a lot of examples like that. But on the other hand, he was also very supportive in that first time I ever went to meet a, a Division One coach, my, co my coach Katz was like, hey, meet Tommy Goodman. He's going to be a Division One player one day. And the coach was like, what? Look at this guy. He's got to keep on. And like, he's like, don't bring me this. Like the guy didn't even shake my hand, the coach. And I put my head down and I walked away because I was so excited to meet him. And that was a reception I got, like the welcome that he wouldn't even shake my hand. And coach was like, don't worry about it. If you keep doing what you're doing, he's going to recruit you one day. And one year later, I got a letter from that coach. And my coach was right. So just having the ability to always have someone to pick you up, but on the other hand, having someone that believed in you when other people didn't, I think like that's that's the special key right there. Wow. If we get in a timeout or something and it was like a, sit, a really hard situation in the game or like say it was like two free throws, like the game was on the line and I was shooting the free throws and most people would be really nervous, coach would go like this. He'd say it like this. After Tamir hits the two free throws, we're going to press. He would say it like that. Like, he just had so much confidence in me that, like, you know, there was no way I could miss after that because coach believed in me so much. So I just go out there and make the two free throws. And, you know, it, it, it was just great to be around someone like that. Wow. Wow. How did the, when you knew your basketball career was over, what was the transition like with him in terms of now he was going to be coaching you on things beyond basketball? Right. If anyone prepared me for it, he did because it was always deeper than just basketball. I think what made my transition from basketball easier, like at 1 million percent was that I was already married at that point and had the best wife. And she was actually the first person who I called. Like I called my wife from the locker room and I said, God doesn't want me to play basketball anymore. I'm sure of it because I'm hurt really, really badly. And I can't, there's just no way I'm going to ever be able to play again. Like my body is in literally in shambles. Like I cannot play, but I gave her my best shot. And she just said, she said, you'll have the same career. You're just going to be wearing a different uniform. That's what she told me. And she was right. And um, so just being able to go through that with her, just having my wife, that's for sure. Like if I didn't have my wife, I I, yeah, I can't even imagine how broken I would have been till, 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 still till today. But just the fact that God blessed me with her, um, that allowed me to, I guess, take the teachings of Coach Katz and implement them because she had my back. And that that was, you know, I, I never take that. I, that is just everything in the world to me, my relationship with my wife. When did you meet her? I met her um, after I got traded in my rookie year. I, I, I met her and um, we just got engaged after two weeks. I, I just felt like she is, I, I couldn't even explain it. I just, I still can't explain it. This is gonna be our 20th anniversary this, this in August. And I could never understand the blessing, like just the open miracle enough that how God like just, Bless me when I need her the most. And um, I, I don't think I'll ever be able to understand the magnitude of that blessing. I won't, I still won't. Cause I keep thinking about it, it's 20 years and well, like, what would I say? What do I think? But I, I just can't, I can't wrap my head around it. It's something I think about every day. It's just the, that is my blessing. That's my blessing right there. Were you, um, 
at that time looking to get married? I felt like I was, I was felt like I was ready to get married. It's just that like everybody else that I knew was like in yeshiva or college. And I was playing professional basketball and I was the only religious um, player in the whole league. So, you know, like, so it's like playing professionally and like, who wants this kind of lifestyle? Like who's going to ever want to marry someone like this where it's like, everything is so intense and the training and the training and the training and the training. And I just, I, I don't know how that was going to be possible to find someone like that. And God brought her right to me and uh, forever, ever grateful to that. What was the hardest part of the game? Like mentally, what was the hardest? When you yeah. play bad, when you play bad, like it just stings, stings so badly. Like I'm 41 now. There's so many times that I wake up in the middle of the night with like a bad possession or a missed shot that I should have made. There's shots that I missed when I was 17 that still hurt me till today. Like with the game on the line, like that I know if I just would have got it off the glass a one inch higher, it would have went in. It happened to me yesterday on Shabbat. Turnover that I had in college, I keep like I don't. Well, I don't like force myself. It's like, I'm going to go think like my brain just goes to that. Like, how did I turn the ball over on that possession? Or even on defense, like I was thinking about a possession yesterday on Shabbat. Like, why did I lunge out on that possession? I should have just stayed like, you know, stayed where I was. I shouldn't have lunged for it. It caused, you know, things like that, that it, it stings. It, let, it hurts so badly for the rest of your life. Wow. <laughs> thing. Yeah. Wow. That's intense. I could even remember all the way back to seventh grade. Like my softer came to watch me play and I played poorly. She came from Israel to watch and I was just devastated. I'm still hurt till today that I, I wanted to play well for her. I wanted her you know, and, I, and I didn't play well. Like, so, it, and she, you know, didn't matter to her at all. But like I think the hardest thing about basketball is like losing a game you, you thought you could have won or, or messing up on a possession that you shouldn't have messed up on it stays with you forever. What do you think is what is the thing that determines or leads to good games, bad games, shots made or shots, shots missed with your experience in the game and looking back? What, what do you think like a player um, could do or could work on to kind of figure out or determine like why did they have a bad game or why did they miss that shot? Yeah. Well, coaches will always tell you, you're never good as good as you think you are when you win and you're never as bad as you think you are when you lose. Um, but, but players don't really accept that because we're too competitive. Um, but I really think it has to do with balance. It has to do with balance in that sometimes you feel like you need to stay the course of the, the keys to the game that the coach planned out for you. And sometimes you need to say like, no, this isn't working. Like we need to like make some adjustments here. And I think finding that perfect balance of like when you need to stay with it or when you need to make some adjustments. Um, and then a lot has to go right. You need to, you need to really be blessed. You need to be blessed. <laughs> you know, like my soft used to say every single thing, you need a blessing. You need a blessing. Like you could prepare, you know, you could do everything right and still play poorly. Sometimes, so you, sometimes you need a little blessing. You need to, things go right for you so you can get your confidence going and, Go out there and do what you know how to do, but mm -hmm. what if the ref, what if the referee calls two early fouls on you and and then you've lost your momentum and you're nervous to play because you're going to get another call or what if you tweak your angle? Look look what happened to Tatum, uh, Celtics right? first first possession of the game in the final to get into the finals. He twists his ankle like on a on a tough play, you know. So it's you also need a lot of blessing. A lot of things need to go right. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was asking but just somewhat out of curiosity, like in terms of a shot made or a shot missed. What do you think, or is that what you mean in terms of the blessing? Or like what do you think? Yeah, at some point, all you could do is put yourself in a situation to succeed. You can't really do more than that. You can't. Mm -hmm. You could do pregame shooting, you could eat the right way, you could sleep the right way, you could study film, you could do all those things to put you in a situation to succeed. You could shoot a perfect shot and sometimes the ball is going to go out. It, it just happens in basketball. It's happened millions of times. 
you know, that think their shots that could have changed the course of history, but just r rolled out. <laughs> so, you know, it's like all you could do is put yourself in a situation to, to succeed. I think that's all you, you can't control anything else other than that. Yeah. I think that's, you know, in a way it's a game, but that's, it's, there's something very, it's very unforgiving in that way. Um, yeah. How do you feel like life compares to basketball in this, in that sense? Do you feel like it's more forgiving, less forgiving? Um, in the sense that if you're doing the right things, because what, what I, what I hear you saying is that like in basketball, you could do all the right things, but there's so much that's left in God's hands that you, um, you know, you could shoot the perfect shot, but it can just roll out. Does your experience of life match that or is it more or less forgiving? I think it's all perspective. I could walk out of my house right now and count a million things that are no good and down and why is this happening to me? Or I could walk out of my house right now and put on a totally different mindset of like all of thank God for all the blessings that I have and ask, you know, what God needs from me instead of what, what I need from God. And then the perspective lines up completely differently. So I think it's each person and our attitude and how we see things. Obviously there's a lot of challenges that are unthinkable and unimaginable and unexplainable, but from the, for the day-to-day -day struggles, I think a lot of it has to do with, with perspective. Yeah, in that way, I think it's more and less forgiving in the sense that, you know, if we if we learn how to have more control over our perspective and we have deeper awareness of ourselves, it can be much more forgiving because the outcome of the day, whether we what we expected or were striving for happening or not happening, wouldn't really affect our overall feeling of success and fulfillment as long as we um, did what we were supposed to do or put ourselves in the position to succeed. Um, but I think that for someone who's had a harder time controlling that and, and looks at where they are in life more in terms of the results, life can be much more unpredictable than a game and, and, and very unforgiving. Um, what do you think yeah. about that? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, but somehow we need to like, like, like going back to my injuries, like I can't even do my favorite thing in the world, like through those challenges and, and like climbing through those challenges, we could find our meaning and our purpose and our happiness almost on a higher level than if we didn't tap into them. So a lot of it has to do with perspective. I'm sorry, That's I really right. have to go get my son in one minute from, from school. My wife's yes. not here yeah okay so, so um thank you very much yeah for on this ride with me it was Yo, really it was awesome to get to know you thank you so much and blessings with everything and looking forward to being in touch okay all the all best right. bye, bye bye all the best